You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I say fair play to Louis Walsh, you know. He's, he's actually a really good man. He says, lads, I'll make you the sun, the moon and the stars. And we believed him. And he fucking did. I had everything. I had the million pound house, I had the Porsches, Ferraris, Lambos, fucking champagne and caviar for everyone. A lot of the TV shows we were doing at the time, uh, your live and kickings and your GMTVs and all that kind of stuff, that came with certain amounts of uh, performances, and I don't just mean musically. I mean, on they would ask you to to read out certain things, all auto cue, all this, all that. And I very quickly started to slip to the back of the group when, when it came to that because I couldn't read any of that shit. I started to play on that kind of mystery and that darkness and become very unpredictable. I mean, one year we were on a plane, I think it was 111 flights one year. And you know, that's, that's some crazy shit. Crazy, crazy shit. And, and they, the record company, they just, they just kept going. They just kept churning it out. Standing on stage as four instead of five. Looking where my brother always was. And just not there. That was mad shit. I was in a mad spiral downwards anyway. So it was the best thing that ever happened that we didn't head into the US and, and continue that journey. We were fucked. Boom, we're on. <laughs> <laughs> and today's guest, we've got a boys' own legend, Shane Lynch. How are you, brother? What's the crack? Not all. Ah, yeah. Home. What's the crack? <laughs> How have you been? Really good. Good. Yeah, really good in these mad times. It'd be uh, silly not to talk about them for sure. Yeah. But you know, uh, I think um, we're on the up. We're on, we're on the up. I think mm -hmm. for me, anyway. Yeah, you look happy. I am happy. Good. I don't know if it's because you're sitting across from me, but <laughs> well, listen, the biggest podcaster in the world. You know what I'm saying? So you know. You know it, brother. The honor's all mine. <laughs> it's a cracking. What is a, a cracking gaff you're in here, man? What is this? This is a, a studio, TV studio I've been building for the last three, four months, and uh, you know what? It's it's all about I think where I saw the world going, and the world going from the whole lockdown scenario. Um, and the way me as a public figure or a guy you see on telly, knowing that it's, it's all going to get a little bit more difficult and a little bit harder for everybody to fight their way through the pack. Like, there's a lot of artists out there uh, in the industry, and now they're sat on their arse. That's the truth. They're sat on their arse going, well, who's going to give me the next, the next uh, pay, payload here? So I kind of looked beyond that and thought, right, I want to make my own shows. I want to make my own TV shows and have my own guests on, which is your yes. good self later on tonight. Um, and it's basically kind of, and given, given a little bit of, when I say hope and chance, um, it's kind of, uh, we are a, well, you're sat by the bar here, Shenanigans, we're calling it, right? And in the Shenanigans, this is a zero alcohol bar, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, because it's kind of dealing with cars, you know, I'm a car head. So the Shenanigans bar basically is, um, we're going to we show some clips of, of different things of what, you, what people like to flick through on their phone constantly all day, all day. So kind of trying to relate to the people too. And then just have a laugh and a giggle about them, which we're going to show you some clips later on, uh, on the show. And it's called My Dream Machine. And My Dream Machine is we kind of uh, are building this TV show and building this set. We go live every Tuesday nights, uh, 7 p.m. It's a Facebook thing. We don't have the big conglomerate TV people on our side. And I think we don't want them. We want to just create our own little space. Yeah. And within that own little space, you, ha you make your own rules. And making your own rules for me was always important as a kid growing up to an extent. I always kind of uh, suffered with authority. So I'm trying to <laughs> carve my way in the mm -hmm. future with my own rules. Mm -hmm. That's great though that you're thinking outside the box because I believe social media and stuff is booming. YouTube is booming. Your stuff's on YouTube and we're beating some of the biggest TV channels out there with millions of viewers per month. So no matter if it's Facebook, Instagram, if you're hitting numbers and doing something that you enjoy, that's the whole thing about it. Do you know what I mean? It's just finding something else to, not a backup plan, but it's another avenue to promote yourself, do interviews and enjoy something that you love to do. I think so. I think, um, you know, spending years and years traveling the world in boy zone and going from radio station to TV station and all kinds of stuff. And it's to build a product as such. But, you know, you're also feeding it to other people's 
front rooms and other people's scenarios and lives for sure. And to kind of think that, okay, Boys Zone's over now, but to kind of think that uh, there's no more avenues other than reality TV shows for me um, or over the last few years I've certainly I've, I've made or carved my way through kind of car programs uh, Nat Geo Global and stuff we did a couple of uh, it was called Supercar Mega Build and then Scrapyard Supercar and a few different series like that and it kind of gave me that little insight to actually I could do this myself and within this box that we're sat in now this is a big warehouse just outside that big sliding door. And that's where a lot of the, the, the custom build stuff and my toys are out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I want to build, I want to bring other, and give opportunity, you know. I think at this point in life, being in any particular position, if you have a way to give folk opportunity uh, to get themselves out there, then it's important. It's important to help, to reach out in many scenarios. And uh, as, a, as a young kid growing up and always always customizing from my skateboard to my BMX to my motorbike to my cars to my trucks, you know what I mean? I was always doing something to them. And there's a lot of amazing creatives out there and artists out there. I call those kind of custom builders artists. And I want to give them a platform to be able to come in here too, come in here and, uh, and showcase their, their custom shops and their builds and stuff, you know, on my TV show. Yeah, fair play. Mm. I always go back to the start with my guest brother, get a bit better understanding yeah. about yourself, where you grew up and how it all began. Born and raised in Dublin. I was born in 1976. That makes me... 40 Old as fuck. <laughs> I think I'm 44. I'm 44. I think I'm 44. 44 years old right now. Um, I was a... Uh, I suppose a, a little bit of a recluse as a kid. Liked my own space. Had my own little uh, conservatory out the back that nobody was allowed in. Full of dinky toys. Created my own little garages and... Uh, uh, streets out of shoe boxes and all that kind of scenario. And I kind of lived in my own dream world as a kid. Um, and when I kind of went to school for the first time, I realized I was different than other kids. I, I wasn't like everybody else. And I was always into different stuff. But one of the main separations of that was plain and simply is my brain didn't work the same way the other kids did. I, I, I'm massively dyslexic. So reading and writing it was immediate that I had, I had a problem. Now it was only immediate to me. It wasn't immediate to my family because I would say I was a good strategist and a ducker and diver and weaver. And I just basically carved my way through the schooling system with charm, I think, good old Irish mm. charm, uh, kind of making sure that I was not a troubled or troublesome kid to the point, but more clever and strategist. Mm-hmm. It's funny that, that I'm dyslexic as well, but I was always staring out the windows and shit and <laughs> more a visionary, but I believe that the most creative people are the ones who think outside the box. If you're not, some people aren't made to be reading books and staring at textbooks and learning their times table. And the most powerful men and people that's been on this planet have been kind of fucked up or dyslexic or some sort of yeah. pain. It's like you try and it's like you find something else to do to say, okay, I'm, I'm not good at this. You think you're a bit of a loser, but I'm going to do this. And then you end up becoming Yeah, I think you're, yeah, we're creatives. Yeah. You know, we definitely are creatives and our minds kind of lend themselves to that a lot better as dyslexics. And I had a program years ago on Channel 5 and that program was um, basically whether or not I had dyslexia. Yeah, I watched it. It was good, man. Powerful. Thank you. I've seen you were nervous as well at a lot of stages. Is that just because you were becoming vulnerable? Massively vulnerable. Yeah. And what it was, it, it kind of regressed you, you know, it regressed you back to those times, those times when you were a kid. You know, I went back into those school corridors where that was the, the walk of, of hell. Most days of my life, every morning I got up, I had to face that walk. And that's a lot of pressure for a kid, I think. You know, I've got two baby girls right now. Well, not so much babies. One's just gone into high school. Um, uh, so, you know, and, I, and, I, and I've always feared, and you know, because you think about your kids and you think, man, I hope they don't ever feel like how I felt walking through the school corridor, you know? So kind of to be, to be taken back to those places of, are they damaging places or are they places of growth? I don't know. Yeah, more damaging. I, I don't think the schooling system is as accurate as it should be. I think learning your times table and your history is great for some people, but mm. what about your creativity and individuality, showing love, meditation, eating right, learning how to grow your own foods. I think stuff maybe like that and other people might think you're crazy, but these are the tools and techniques, especially in things like lockdown. If supermarkets and stuff close, 
how the fuck is people going to survive? People don't know how to grow their own foods. It's war zones, yeah. isn't it? You know, and that's mm-hmm. basically what it is. I mean, we had a good glimpse to it. We, we had a good glimpse to shopping trolleys around the block, around the block, around the other block, you know, for people queuing up to get some bread and milk. And, and I think that was a small snippet into uh, the governing body and the world's governing body and how they are really in control. And I know we all get it, or they, I suppose they think they, we all get a bit big, too big for our boots at times. So they, they kind of show us a little bit of a, nah, let's, we're the ones in control here. Let's, yeah. let's show you what we can and can't do. Mm-hmm. And I'm a firm believer in that. I don't think it's any kind of conspiracy theory. I mean, look, there is, without a doubt, there's a, a disease out there called COVID. And that's fine. And it is kill, killing people. And sadly, and it's, it's, it's killing people in many more ways, not just catching the virus, of course, but in the mental health scenarios and in what it's called and on the ripple effects. Um, but they, I, th- I think that's a very thought, well thought out planned, global government based. Oh, in percent. It's all years in advance yeah. and people can call you crazy or a conspiracy theories, but there is higher powers there that control the world and it's so easy where people can be controlled with fear and drilled fear into them so quick and so fast that people panic. Now all these small stages are getting put in place for the reason being, well, we've just confirmed that there's another lockdown coming. But... It's scary to me how fast the population can be manipulated, yeah. the news, the newspapers. I don't read or watch any of that stuff. It's other people have to tell me. Uh-huh. Because if your brain's like a sponge. It absorbs everything. They call the TV a programme for a reason. It's programming your main mind into thinking the way the world does. Uh-huh. The world's actually a good place. There's a lot of good people in it. And if you don't think so, then I believe become good yourself. Mm-hmm. It's just a weird place to be in right now. But as long as you can keep your head above water and... I like to look at things differently. I like to question everything differently. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Just because I watch certain things on YouTube yep. doesn't make me a fucking expert because <laughs> they could be crazy. I've interviewed guys like David Dyke as well and some things I, I believe, some things I don't. But he could be crazy. The people that's getting put stuff on the news could be crazy. I just question everything that they might be right, they might be wrong. But you know what? I'm not harming anyone. I'll just stay back and just, I'll do what's right for what my soul's telling me. Yeah, I think, well, they're the tools of survival, aren't they? You know, taking a, a bit of everything knowing a bit of everything and if you just kind of stay in one lane then you're going to be brainwashed to one lane be it the right or wrong way but you still have to you have to know the outside uh, effect as well of of you can't just be that honed in i don't think yeah you can go down the rabbit hole and stuff mm. as well it's just listen but make your own assumptions mm. whatever you hear i think so yeah so after the schooling and stuff you struggled and went through but then biggest opportunity of your life going to boys on at 17 do you know, the mad thing is about Boyzone and me being in Boyzone is I, I wasn't even into music, <laughs> you know? I wasn't even into music. I was into music, but it was basically kind of hip-hop and reggae, and that, that, was, that was what I, I kind of thrived on as a kid. Were you puffing um, weed or anything back then? No, way too innocent for that. I, like, all my money went on petrol. Every cent I had went on my motorbike and fueling that machine up. Now, I kind of lived in leafy suburbia, so it wasn't just kind of cornfields. There was a lot of, I want to say police chases and uh, naughtiness. It was more because no helmet, no tax, no insurance, just smoking the machine up and down the roads. And it was just fun. It was, uh, to me, 100%, it was innocent fun back then. And I, I didn't even drink till I was 20. Two, twenty-three, something like that. Um, I was just mad on cars, mad on bikes, and every cent I had just went on kind of building machines. Like I got kicked out of school when I was fifteen, and for the simple fact of you know uh, what we sp- spoke about and being dyslexic, um, it it wasn't it wasn't because I was a trouble guy and I was tr- making trouble. It was, I just didn't do anything. I couldn't do anything, so there was no point. I didn't even come into class with books or pens or pencils i just came in because i had to attend as, as a register and eventually the you know the principal just said look just you know we'd appreciate if you don't come back is what he said you know <laughs> <laughs> that's basically what he said if you don't come back everything's cool and i was like all right sound so i asked my dad for a job uh it was a hard time like i shit myself like proper shit myself asking me oh man um for a job but he he luckily enough had his own workshop he's on, he built cars built kind of hot rods and he raced cars himself so it was always in the blood you know what i mean and um, so the ideal kind of scenario for me was to to but you know in life take over family business i had i had a a route to market in terms of who who i was going to be as a human um and luckily 
he was an amazing mechanic. Still is an amazing mechanic. I'm saying like he was in the past tense. He's still alive. Um, but uh, what I learned from that man was was blood, sweat, and tears. He raised six kids. You know, back in a time of of, of hardship when money was hard to come by. I you know the stories I hear my dad talking about uh, not eating food and just feeding the kids for a week, do you know what I mean? And stuff like that. So I grew up in a, in a pretty hard working environment, family environment yeah. that is. And when you went to work, you fucking went to work. There was no, like, rain, hail, sleet, snow, me bollocks, like, get the fuck mm -hmm. out of bed and go to work. And you, you really had to, you had to be in hospital before mm -hmm. you didn't go to work. So I, I on, a, on a kind of similar scenario to yourself, I think there's a, it's a certain um, amount of get up and go that's ingrained in you. Uh, be that a, a, an addictive sense of uh, uh, of your nature, I think uh, I'm a I'm a workaholic without a doubt. Probably not. I wouldn't say because of that, but I I think it's it's inherited uh, views. It's it's visual views. It's what you see your parents do. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of our stuff can be offered in inherited lies. Um, you know, from a young boy uh, or girl growing up and seeing mother and father in certain turmoil kind of situations or family uh, marriage situations and, and that's how they treat their women or their men and so there's a lot of visual and, and, and lies that you see growing up that are our parents responsible for no but it's that's how you grew and that's what you think until you decide oh shit there's a different world out there and I don't have to be that person I can be me yeah it's funny how you get labelled now whether it's dyslexic or whatever it is and then you've kind of got that label shit is that what it is but it's okay to understand what's right and what's wrong and mm. with you, you're trying to figure it out. Did you, I felt a bit like a failure at school because I was like, ah, they're better than me. So I was always trying to make people laugh then. Right. So I couldn't yeah. fucking do anything. So I was a class clown. So yeah, yeah. I made people laugh. I was good at making people laugh. So that deflected that away. That was fucking, not saying that I was stupid, but I just couldn't do what the other people could do. So I hung yeah. about the bad people just deflects in a way that I was dumb basically, but it's I weird. I kind of avoided that scenario. Um, kind of being class clown because I, I didn't want to stand out. I did the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, when I said I was charming, I, I was more about greeting the teacher and being nice nice to them and kind of like, oh, I've seen Shane there. I won't ask him a question. Who's, who's, you know, who's about? And that was my strategy. Or I became the, the best sportsman in that school, you know, if, if it was long jump, I was jumping the longest. If it was high jump, I'm jumping the high. I'm taking home the gold. Mm -hmm. That's what I am doing. I'm taking home the trophy for that school. And that's where I kind of concentrated on, just uh, being the high school jock, if you want to yeah. call it. You're not like the quarterback. Mm -hmm. um, the guy who's like, you're doomed without him. If he's not on your team, you've had it. And I kind of tried to create that scenario. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm very Americanized in, in all that I do, actually. I'm very Americanized. I've always looked at America um, for the style uh, of person that I am and the music, my own musical influences. Like, you're going back to U2, Cranberry, Sinead O'Connor, like rock, 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 rock. That's what Ireland is, it's rock renowned. And, you know, I was just a little hip hop kid in baggy pants rolling around, yeah. you know, <laughs> with EPMD on my little boombox and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was, that's why I was always different as a kid too. Um, and, I, and I think when it came to the boy zone scenario and getting into one of the biggest opportunities in life, I just saw that as another avenue of of uh, of a door opening and and like I had I knew fuck all about music you know <laughs> like no how time. many people went for that was there auditions or anything there was it's a funny little scenario uh, and it kind of breaks down to myself and this other guy set up boys on it was the other guy's idea he came to me and he said look do you want to be in a band. And I said, oh, <laughs> what are you talking about? And he, he, says, he says, you know, you've got the right look and all that. And he says, have you ever seen them boys? And he, and he referenced, take that. And I was like, yeah, yeah, because I've got five sisters. Mm -hmm. So I was like, yeah, go to New Day and Bross and all them kind of boys there. So I was like, yeah, yeah, he goes, yeah, well, a bit like that, but an Irish version of it. And I was like, oh, all right then. Sounds, sounds fair enough to me. So hold on a sec. That's me, man, now. <laughs> um, so I kind of said, I said, right, well, what do we have to do? And he goes, well, we need a manager, you know, we need a manager. I said, all right, ma manager, right, that sounds good. So my, one of my oldest sisters, uh, Tara, she was in a stage school scenario kind of things. They were, they were all musical. My whole family's musical. Uh, one of my cousins is, is like world champion pipe drummers and the other is bagpipe. Like, they're all mad musical. They had fiddle players and you name it. Um, and all my sisters are all singers and all yeah, dancers. Yeah, they're all in Bewitched. All, yeah, yeah, Bewitched is a couple of the girls. I think... 
out of all my family, there's only, as in my immediate siblings, there's uh, one of us who didn't have a record deal, you know? And the black sheep, the family, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the clever one of the family <laughs> went off to America. She did. Um, and, and we kind of, when, when it came to finding management, she, she was, uh, she said, right, she was in those plays, like, you know, like Pantos and all that every year and all that. She goes, oh, there's, uh, there's this guy called uh, Louis Walsh. And he, at the time, he was a uh, big fish in a little pond, little old Ireland. And Louis Walsh, obviously Louis Walsh that you see on X Factor now and all that kind of scenario, next to Mr. Kell, um, he used to look after show bands in Ireland. So uh, he was the legend of the who you went to. And the biggest guy he would have looked after at the time was a guy called Johnny Logan. And Johnny Logan was Eurovision Song Contest winner twice for Ireland or something like that. So hero. <laughs> Johnny Logan's the hero here. You know what I'm saying? So we got his name and we set up a little... Uh, a little um, meeting with him to, to kind of give him the idea of this Irish boy band. But I've got to go to my dad now. You know, I've got to go to my dad and say, I need some time off work, like. And that doesn't bode well with my dad, you yeah. know. And family business and all that. But he was amazing. And, and I, I love my dad for this. I love my mum and dad. Have, they're very out there in terms of... Th there was no kind of... Uh, barriers set as for us as kids. Whatever we wanted to do, they were like, you go and do that. So I've got, a, 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 you know, incredible kind of, when I look back and think, my mom and dad were awesome, absolutely awesome. And I just said to my dad, you know, I said, dad, I need, the, I need the morning off work. And he's like, all right, son. He says, what's, what's that for, you know? I said, well, I said, well uh, I'm going to meet a manager. And he says, do you work for me? He says, yeah, and he goes, well, what, what, who's the manager? I said, well, you see, I'm going to be in a band. <laughs> <laughs> he was as steel faced as you, and he was like, I want to be in a band, son. I said, yeah, I'm here, yeah. He goes, tell me something, he says, son. He says, uh, what do you play? I said, no, what do you mean? He goes, like, instrument, what do you play? I said, I don't play anything. And he goes, right. He says, well, tell me something, son. He says, do you sing? I went, Oh, not really. And he goes, right. Right. He said, yeah. So what are you going to do in this band? I said, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> <laughs> he, says, he goes, for fuck's sake, right, be back by two o'clock. <laughs> so he could have kicked me in the hole. Mm -hmm. Kicked me in the hole and said, get into that garage there and stop your messing. But he didn't. He did have a fair point, though, if you never... He had yeah. the best point. Like, if you kicked me in the hole, I went, yeah, I'll get, I'll get you that. <laughs> it's one of those things. And, and he didn't. And, and off me and this fellow went... And we met Louis Welch, and we told them the idea of, we want to make this Irish take that. And they were the biggest boys at the time. And uh, Louis Welch pulled out, a, it just, he had a silver briefcase, and he pulled out all this Filofax stuff, and he was showing us the schedules of all these other bands. And he said, and I, I say fair play to Louis Welch, you know, he's, he's actually a really good man. He says, lads, I'll make you the sun, the moon, and the stars. And we believed him. And he fucking did. Yeah. He fucking did. Like, <laughs> and from that process, as you see in auditions, early stages of auditions, uh, me, this other guy, uh, Louis Walsh, and another couple of people sat behind a desk and all the other boys came in and auditioned. So I, I seen Ronan Keaton come in and audition and Duffy and Mick and Steele and they all came in. I had no fucking clue what I was doing. I was just <laughs> sat behind a desk like uh, going, <laughs> he's all right, isn't he? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. And it was a bit like, it was, it was a... Uh, it was, it was just a chance, a, a chance. Uh, I, I read a book or an autobiography many years back called The Chancer. And in that was just explains my life and just going for it, like just taking a chance and, and just hoping for the best. Fake it until you make it. Take, yeah, fake it until you make it, you know? And, and, I, and I think there's just a lot to be said for going, ah, fuck it, I'll get it done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, fair play, man. One of the biggest boy bands in British history, over like, 25 million Single soul, that's it is phenomenal. Uh, my mum, my sister, and that are massive fans of boys. On I like them myself. Do you know what I mean? We don't like them, but that shit, do you? Well, that's, <laughs> well, you know what? I, I understand. Like I, I remember years ago. Uh, I under, it's a funny thing growing up in a boy band, 17, 18, 19 years old, and you do get a female attention, and the lads just want to fucking, you just want to roll. That's that. All they want to do is fight, and 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 there was a lot of fighting in the early days of boys on, but there was a lot of understanding too. I never threw the first blow, ever. Because I, I get why that fella there has a problem with me. I fucking get it. I understand it. Because if my board 
is chatting about some other geyser, I'm going to have a problem. Of course I am. So I always understood the other man's pain, if that makes sense. The other man's pain that his board was into. And it was, I was more apologetic than anything. Like, oh, sorry about that, mate. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll tell you real quick about it. You know, one of, the, one of the most horrible things that ever happened to me. And, and I, it never left me. And, it, and it's horrible things like this. But it's, it's very innocent. But uh, I was in uh, traveling about, it would have been a race weekend, actually, uh, back in early 90s. And in usual, in hotels, there's weddings and weekends. And that's the, that's, that's the buzz. And right enough, I ended up meeting the, the, the bride. And she came out for the pictures and all that kind of shit. And later on in the night, I was just having a a few quiet points with the, with the team and, and the groom the husband came up and you know what he said and, and it, it was horrible he, he says he says thanks very fucking much he said for ruining my wedding night you know what I mean meaning like his wife was kind of like mad about that and all of a sudden he's, he felt inferior at that point but I understood him you know I understood him and, and, I, and I genuinely felt like a cunt like I felt oh, man, I'm, like I'm, I'm so sorry I, took it's not light. my intention yeah. like, you know what I mean yeah fuck him man but no, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm soft like that like I'm not I'm not just hardened and out yeah. there to, I'm not bullish I, I, I genuinely have a heart yeah. and and you know it, it, kind of, it did affect me I'll never forget it for sure and anytime I ever see any fucking wedding I am on my head torn <laughs> torn and I'm yeah. gone even if they were like, oh, please, come. I'm like, fucking gone. Yeah. I just never I just never want to do that again. But you up portray this kind of the, the bad boy of the group, and how did you get that reputation then? Do you know what? I, I think I got that, the bad boy of boys on earth, because I th- as, my, as my visuals, it probably started as a visual, um, when we got into the band, and the band was up and running, and our first UK record, say, uh, 1994 into smash hits on the road on the tour we were all we had a particular suit look and all that and that, that's what the stylist at the time was. So I wasn't going against record company that as a stylist but into kind of 95 I was like hold on a minute don't particularly like what I'm wearing so let me have a, let me have a little <laughs> character readjustment here at this point I was I was sturdy I was in the band there was no like you know like right you're out you know what I mean <laughs> kind of thing yeah. we, we, we were fixed so I thought right let me undo the the kind of clean cut clean cut and just go back to me back to me for who I was being different not necessarily being a bad boy because like I said I'm, I'm not that I'm not a bad guy uh, in that scenario but I am a bit rough around the edges for sure and I just I battle authority I like to do my own thing and I like to be me and that said I ended up just kind of going a little bit more hip hop and a little bit back into who I was as a kid um, and then I think the the biggest one was just, I think I kind of got frustrated within the music industry. And the frustration of that comes from you're in a magical place in the first place, what people think that is. So you are in a dream world. Like being an artist, being a musician, being at the top of your game and selling out arenas, selling out thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of fucking tickets. Um, you know, that's a fucking dream for many, many people. And I suppose I had a certain amount of, it's called something, I don't know what the fuck it's called, but when you're in a place where you think you shouldn't be, I I, I don't know, there's a a word for it. Um, But I didn't deserve it, you know. I didn't, I wasn't singing and writing songs and playing guitars all my fucking life to now step out into arenas like I'm this artist. I'm just in there going, (laughs) shit, man, (laughs) this is mad, you know what Uh I mean? And I I think that kind of maybe took its toll a little bit of, oh, you know, and, and one of the things for my character change too was a lot of the TV shows we were doing at the time, uh, your live and kickings and your GMTVs and all that kind of stuff, that came with certain amount of uh, performances. And I don't just mean musically. I mean, on they would ask you to, to read out certain things, all auto cue, all this, all that. And I very quickly started to slip to the back of the group. When, when it came to that, because I couldn't read any of that shit. I couldn't do any of those intros. Next coming up is blah, 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 blah. Because all auto cue uh, stuff. Uh, for those who don't know what auto cue is, uh, when you're watching uh, Philip and Holly on this morning and stuff like that, like they, when they're looking straight down the barrel of that camera, uh, there's a big screen in front of them that has all the written words that scrolls across, but obviously you can't see it uh, in the way that it's all reflected. So that's what auto cue is. So you, you think they're amazing at their jobs, which they are, don't get me wrong, but uh, you know, it's all written there right yeah. in front of them and everything comes out of their mind. It's not like they went and learned a script. It's mm-hmm. not like that. So 
I, I kind of slipped back into the background that what the boys uh, and let them all go to the front. But then that kind of came with a little bit of darkness, to be fair. It came with a little bit of mystery and a bit of mysterious kind of, like, why is this guy always in the background? But then I played on that. I started to play on that kind of mystery and that darkness and become very unpredictable. And that was just my way of expression. And the visuals, the tattoos, all that kind of thing started to just build in my character and who I was. The, the gold, you know, <laughs> whatever I was wearing at the time. It was, that was me talking. Mm -hmm. That was me talking without having to talk. And I felt comfortable there, though. I felt comfortable because people were afraid to approach me. And if you didn't approach me, then I couldn't get anything wrong, right? Yeah. Is that why you've done it, though? Yeah. Like, going back to your youth when you were kind of the recluse, kind of in the back room yourself. How does that work then from someone who wouldn't read a book out in school to then performing in front of 20,000 people? That's just totally night and day, isn't it? It's night and day, but I was always a performer. Yeah. See, that's the difference. So you acted your way through it? I acted my way through mm -hmm. the whole thing, the same as I did in school. <laughs> always a performer. So, yeah. um, and that made, me, that made me really be into entertainment then because mm -hmm. it wasn't about the, 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 the singing and the songwriting and the studio. I loved studio, actually. I loved going in and recording songs. But I'm not a writer for obvious reasons. Pen to paper doesn't work. Um, so I just ended up being labelled as a bad boy because I just I probably started to say fuck off this and fuck off that on, on telly as well and live TV. I got banned from Irish Light. The reason why a lot of live Irish television doesn't go on anymore is because of me and si <laughs> things I did. <laughs> you know, like mad little yeah. things like that started to happen. Public Enemy Number One of Ireland at one point, you know. Um, but. That's not just because of choice. I think that's obviously because of the industry we lived in. The industry we live in, look, you, you, you know it's drug-filled, it's alcohol-filled, it's pressure-filled, it's depression-filled, it's, it's suicide-filled, it's, it's a lot of things. And that was that would have been starting going into the late 90s. And that was starting to creep into the world we were living, my world anyway, that we were living in. Um, I started to go to the party, started to booze, started to, to, to stay out late, started to kind of find a, a crutch, I suppose, a crutch within the industry. And the mad thing is, it's, you are trying to, you are trying to hide and drown out your own brain, the sounds of, of, of what you don't want to be involved in anymore, who you are anymore. There was no, pattern there was no home life there was no you just traveled the world you traveled the world uh most days i mean one year we were on a plane i think it was 111 flights one year and you know that's, that's some crazy shit crazy crazy shit and and they the record company they just they just kept going they just kept churning it out and it was fine at the time we were young we were kids we were making a, a product called boys on um, but in backstage <laughs> in the dark rooms of the mind that's where everything just started to break down and, and and i think it's more it's not just hard work led it's also it is industry led it's spirit led like the industry is full of of demon and spirit and dark fucking shit i know that i've been through it i'm not just kind of saying willy-nilly that it's 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 kind of full moon and werewolves no it's fucking witchcraft and and fucking dark sh demonic shit yeah, how was that then for such a young age to then get thrown into that limelight? Was there any people who took you under their wing and try to like, channel you down a, and understand the game that it is? Because it's just a big game. You're just a pawn through somebody else's whoever's got the business or whoever you're working for. You're just a pawn until you, your record sales go down and then you're kind of bound. Was there anybody to take you aside and say, look, watch out for this or stay away from drink or drugs or was it just a case of we're just going to burn you into the ground until we can get what we can get? I'm going to say it was born you to the ground, without a doubt, born you to the ground. And we split up in year 2000, early 2000. Uh, we had flown to uh, the US, we flew to, uh, to New York uh, to meet a record company out there. Um, we, as you do, as pop stars, you flew on Concord, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Flew on Concord to New York, went and had a meeting. We were only in for less than 24 hours. Had a meeting and we were a priority act for the US uh, going forward that year. And at, I think at one point, we just all had a, a massive fucking bust up and not, not fisty cuffs, but just, we came to the end of our tether. Came to the end of our tether and we said, right, that's it. We, we had enough, we had enough. And rightfully so. I mean, I was in a mad spiral downwards anyway. So it was the best thing that ever happened that we didn't 
head into the US and, and continue that journey, we were fucked. You're only about what, 23, 24 as well, still young. Oh, what do we mean? May, maybe that, yeah. Maybe that. So were you drinking years drugs years. and stuff at that time? Was that all the, to numb the... Boozing, we're mad yeah. boozers. All us boys on Irish boys were booze based. We're, I think it's different in the UK culture and maybe world culture, but I never came from a drug background. Never did. And not, it's, it just never took my fancy. I love a gargle and, <laughs> and I, love a, I love a party. I love a booze. I love kind of, I love getting fucked up. I love drinking from 11 a.m. in the morning till what o'clock like every day, every day. Escapism, as, as, as you say, you know, I, I think depression was probably mad heavy at that time and Boyzone was over and there was like, no car outside to pick me up to go anywhere that had been like every day of my life for the last seven, eight years. And it was just like, well, there you go. What do you want to do with your life? And fuck me, I played, I, I think I sat indoors for weeks after weeks after weeks. I bought like a, a PlayStation or something. I'm not even a gamer, but I bought a PlayStation for something to do. And I remember at one point, <laughs> I, I didn't come out of the house for like a month. And I finished this game called Resident Evil. And when I finished it, I picked it all up and fucked it in the bin. I said, I'm never getting a game console ever again. And I think that's part of the addiction. Uh, I have an addictive spirit, of course, um, to, to drive, to be the best, to, to move, uh, to get something and, and create the best out of that something. That's an, addic an addictive spirit, I think. Um, but be it alcohol, be it TV shows, be it music, be it like, you know, if you're gonna do it, do it fucking right. Did you get addicted to the limelight and the success as well? No, I don't think I got addicted to the limelight or success. Success, yes, but not the limelight in terms of, hey, look at me. Um, I went the opposite way, back to who I was as a kid, a recluse. Uh, it wasn't about look at me whatsoever. Um, and then I kind of started to come out of that with race cars. Race cars was like, where do you feel that? Where do you feel that mad buzz? Where do you feel standing on stage with 100,000 people and that the energy that you get from that, how, how do you possibly top that up? That's a fairy tale world. Adrenaline. Adrenaline, mad adrenaline. That's like, it's incredible. How do you get that if, you, if you've known that for so long? And then is that something you crave? But I know I, I found it through race cars. I found it through putting a helmet on and putting yourself on life's edge, I suppose. Mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of- uh, Adrenaline junkie? Yeah, extreme, extreme <laughs> stuff. Uh, but uh, extreme back in the day from bungee jumps to, I don't know, base jumps to race cars to, you know, all that kind of thing that, that just gets your, <laughs> your blood flowing. Yeah. Uh, so you had all that buzz, all that adrenaline, mm. all that attention. But again, we're, as human beings, we're constantly searching. We just try to figure it out. When you look back, when you look back at it all, do you think, would you do it again? Hell yeah. Because <laughs> 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 yeah. it was seven years isn't that long. You could have carried on for another five years, 10 years, whatever. It's not long in a lifespan, but it's crazy long in that kind of torturous place. Yeah. It's fucking torturous. In what way? It's torturous mentally. It's, it's torturous physically. It's tor like that your kind of world travel and your time zones that you're constantly flipping between when you're meant to be sleeping, and meant to be on stage, meant to be on stage, meant to be sleeping. And it's, it's not like you got a, a week's rest between. No, you're night after night after day after night after TV show, after radio, after concert. And, what you, you know, one of the ways I kind of ever try and explain it to someone is when, you, when you're going on holiday, to get to that flipping airport, to start packing your bags, to, say, to what are you going to bring, what are you going to do, how are you going to bring it? You just put, pack the suitcase, you wait for the taxi, the taxi's flipping late, you get to the airport, the queues for the goddamn check-in is long, then the queues for the security is long, and then you get on the plane, and you sit there for fucking five hours scratching out a hole, doing nothing with a little shit dinner, then you get to the other side and the bus is late, and eventually, eventually, on your holiday, eventually you get to your apartment. And if that's a nice place to be, then you relax for two weeks and you have a great time. Well, we do all that shit journey fucking every day. <laughs> so you're fucking stressed out, you're not, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Stressed out, you're not. And it, it just, it takes its toll on you. It's not, it's not you're going on holiday. It's just mad work after work after work every yeah. day. Yeah. So once you broke up, once that came to an end, did your life get worse? Did you have more depression because you, you had nothing to fill your, your life? Like it was in a big void? Yeah, I think so. I, I think... 
I think definitely I went down, down way, way more into a depression or a depressive state. Um, did anybody see this? Or did you hit the actor <clears throat> come back in and kind of mask no, it? nobody saw that. Uh, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I was lucky enough to have my own piece of land. Once the gates closed, you are behind them gates, you know? And I think I just had to work it out for myself. Now, my family are amazing people, but uh, I pushed them away. I didn't, have, I didn't want to talk to anyone. I didn't, want to, 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 I didn't want help. I wasn't looking for help. I didn't think I needed help. Let's start there first. I actually didn't think there was anything wrong with me. I just didn't want to fucking see a, a soul in life. Just everyone leave me the fuck alone. And looking back, of course, I was depressed as fuck. <laughs> you know, like, like, oh my God. I, I, it was, it's nigh on suicidal, isn't it? You know, it's, you're, you're drinking yourself to death in, into, you know, just self, self, self harm, self destruct. And all you're trying to do is numb, numb what? Numb the, the lack of understanding of what the fuck I'm meant to do. You know, yeah. I don't know what I'm meant to do. Uh, so what am I meant to do? Um, what do I? And I think slowly what I started to s I kind of go back to the simple life, and the simple life meaning a pattern, um, not necessarily a schedule, but getting back into one. I remember as like being a kid, you know, you came home and you watched uh, Home and Away, and and your pre little program, and you started to just at three o'clock, uh, you know, you're home, you eat your pizza, and you're watching Home and Away with the shit. And I started to get into a little routine and a pattern on little programs on telly, and I started to go, oh, I like that, oh, I like that. And and I've never, you didn't have Netflix like we do now, and the laptop, and uh, when you're traveling the world, you just had yourself and your own thoughts. So you didn't know what programs were out there, or what the TV shows were on, whatever the rest of the world was, or country, the UK was talking about. Um, and I started to get into that little, oh, yeah, this is good. And then you can have, then you can conversate with someone. Like a lot, most people's lives are conversated around their daily life. You can't conversate with anyone with the fucking life we live unless you are conversate with the same kind of person. And that, because you're, you're, you're bored to, you're bored out of your fucking mind answering the same questions that you answer all the time that other people want to ask you about the life you live being a pop star. So you just want normal conversation. <laughs> so eventually you find that. And then eventually you kind of see a light or a rhyme and a reason. But I, there's, I, th I think in about late 01, 02, I started to look at music projects again, but on a, on a kind of more love projects, not necessarily looking to release, but just making music for what that is, and more to what I was into. And one of my best friends from back in the day and to is now, uh, a guy called Ben Afedu, he was a singer in Fats and Smalls. And he, he himself, uh, he, he was always one of the guys I looked up to within the industry. I don't have many industry friends, I'm not really interested in industry friends. Um, but for some reason, I had a, a great connection with this guy, Ben. And over the years, we've always kind of, we hung out in the, the London scene, the hip hop scene. And to kind of, as a pop band, a pop act, uh, Boys Own, I always found myself. Uh, going back to the music I love, of course. And that's going, and, and back in the day, back in London, in the kind of late 90s and early 90s, uh, you know, hip hop was underground. It's not like as we know it today, it's the forefront of the musical charts. It was proper grimy, grimy places, maybe two, three you could go to uh, within London. And that's where me and Benny always found ourselves, another pal of mine called Abs uh, from Five, and another guy called Dane Bowers, amongst many, which are doing a music project right now called Boys on Block. But that's, that, they were coming out of my crew from back in the day. Um, and he was one of the guys, when I started to kind of look at music again, uh, he, he started to bring me out of my depression from the way he was as a person. His general walk of life. I fucking had everything. I had everything. I had the million pound house, I had the Porsches, Ferraris, Lambos, fucking champagne and caviar for everyone, you know what I mean? But this guy, and I was depressed as fuck, and this guy, he was just, regular man I mean he had a big hit record Fast and Smalls massive massive band but you know still working his way up in the music people think you, you make you make a, a number one record and that's it you, you got you got your mansion it's not like that it's fucking hard graft and he was still making his way through life but he his his mind his body his soul his attitude he had it all and I just wanted to know why why was he so flipping happy? And I wasn't. <laughs> so I said, you know, I, I, I approached his manner. I approached his, him as a being. And the way he started to speak to me was, it was biblical, not going to lie. It was a biblical way of speaking in parodies in terms of just lines from the Bible, stories from the Bible, and just breaking them down to me and what they mean to me 
in today's living. And the more I, I, I heard him speak, the more he spoke to me, the more, the more I went to the light, if you want to call it, uh, is the more I, uh, my belly started to get fed. I started to fill a void of, of loneliness and that depression started to be, started to lift, I suppose, because I started to find joy in the word and the word was, it was, it was biblical words. It was the word of Christ. And the more music projects we did, the longer we stayed friends and in uh, other bands and doing stuff is the more I could be with this guy and to, to take me out of a dark place. I knew the dark, like I knew the dark well. I was involved in certain demonic things over my late 90s into no, early 90s. So I, I know the fucking dark side. So it was just plain and simple for me. If I know the dark, then it has to be a light. And I followed it, I followed the light. And life changed dramatically, absolutely dramatically, when it came to my love of Christ. So you focused all your energy on to someone else, higher power, Christ, mm -hmm. whatever people look at it differently. So you believe that saved your life? Definitely, 100%. How old were you? Jeez, I don't know. It was oh, oh, late 02 into 03. So it was just the early 30s? Yeah, uh, probably not old. I don't know, I'll do the math. <laughs> I don't know. So, yeah, but um, I, I'm not too sure how old I was. Um, but I, I said, I, I, my wife now, the, I met her in late... Uh, was it late 02? I'd known it for a couple of years in the industry. Um, but we got together in kind of early 03. And she, uh, her dad was a bishop. And her brother was the pastor of a church. Because uh, dad had passed away at that point. Um, and the more we were together, and there was, she, she's the same, she's a born again Christian. And it was the more light I was fed from her, is the more I wanted to know more again. And I started to go to a Bible class, a Bible study on a Wednesday night. And it was just amazing. I mean, the food I was given was amazing. <laughs> I don't just mean the rice and peas and dumplings. Mm. I'm talking about spiritual food. Like, it was, it was just to, the sweetest taste I've ever tasted in my life. You know, the, 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 the want for it, the hunger for it, week after week was just incredible. I was excited. I hadn't been that excited for years. Yeah. Excited to hear the word, excited to be filled, excited to get that knowledge, excited to grow, excited just to get out of the fucking dark shit. And that's really where my, my change came from. Yeah, to find some purpose again. Mm. It's, it's scary, man, being in a dark place and drinking and not having any drive to get up in the morning and mm. hiding from your pain and masking it, whether it's success or fucking hookers or coke or alcohol, is to mask it, but it takes true inner strength to then find a purpose, mm -hmm. whether that's turning to Christ, whether that's just trying to become a better person, whether that's taking control of your addictions, whether that's admitting it. When you obviously went into your depression, you were too proud to say to anybody you were struggling. Because as men back then, we don't understand. We, we, we're totally suppressed with feelings and emotions. It's hard to open up because people go, oh, shut up, you fucking mm. this or that. It's, now I, I realise that speaking out is your chance of healing. It's your chance of growing as an individual and understanding that we're all a little fucked up. Mm -hmm. We've all got a little bit of misery. No matter if you're a pastor or no matter if you're a born again Christian, we're still a bit fucked up. We're still a bit loopy, but whatever you're focusing on, as long as you're doing the right thing, as long as you're not harming anyone, then do whatever you want. But it is a, it's a weird time for everybody, but you got out of it, so respect. Are you still working progress today? Are you still battle? 100%. Do you think? Oh, you never fucking golden child, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, without a doubt, I wake up with bad days, man. I'm, you know, I still battle with a lot of demons. Um, a lot of demons, for sure. And they, they come from many different areas, I suppose. But uh, I, I think it's, it's a journey. Life, of course, is a fucking journey. But it's, it's full of the hills and valleys and... If you're just on top of that hill all the time, then uh, I don't know who the fuck you are, but well done. Yeah. Um, but if you're if you're at the bottom of the valley, you can climb up, you can get out, you can have a great fucking day, and you can slip back down. Of course you can. Go fast. You can slip yeah. back down, and and I think the more we learn about our, hormo our hormonal selves as men and women, uh, you know, you said rightly there about 
growing up as a kid, you're meant to suppress those feelings or those emotions. Or you're meant to be a man, aren't you? You're meant to be a, a boy. You're meant to be fucking solid. You're not meant to cry about shit. And I think the more we're allowed to talk about that, it's it's nice. It's fucking nice. Yeah. It's nice to be able to, to kind of unload or to to kind of tell somebody your problems and to show you an avenue, an avenue or a way out of them. Mentally, that is. And but some days I'm, you know. I, I've kind of recently gone into, uh, I call it my shrink, uh, since maybe just me, I remember just when lockdown happened, I started kind of shrink se sessions. And again, just to Americanize things because that's how I think. Um, but some days I don't want to talk to him. You know, some days I don't want to fucking speak. And some days I don't want to say shit I don't want to say. And some days I cannot wait to talk to the man. Some days I need to talk to the guy. And some days I come off the end of that phone going, oh, thank God. Thank God I fucking spoke to him. Because your, 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 your brain is your fucking brain. Like, it doesn't matter. When you wake up in the morning, and I think we, we, we spend too much time looking around us for who, who, you know, everybody else and what they're thinking and what's on the telly and what's that. When you wake up in the morning and open your eyes, you are you. Nobody else is you. You're fucking you. And how you think today is what's going to make you, you. And how you act today is going to make your life's scenarios and situations. And if you can control them, and as you said rightly, try and do what's right, then things are more than likely going to be all right. If you're waking up with no fucks given and ready to give the world no fucks given, then there's a lot of shit can come your way. So yeah. I think it's important to be you and be strong for you. It's difficult because now we've got social media. The, mo the first hour you wake up in the morning is your most creative. Same as the last hour you go to sleep. It's the most creative where you're, when you're sending your frequencies out where you will attract that. So if you're waking up in the morning, flicking through your phone, can't be asking up, looking at other people thinking that they're living their life, you're sending out those signals that your life's inadequate. You don't feel good enough. Where, mm -hmm. And that's exactly what you're going to feel. So if you have a negative thought, if you have an insecure thought, what you're going to do, you're going to automatically feel insecure. And if you do that, consistently every morning every morning you're going to follow those patterns and it is difficult the changes that you've made the changes that myself has made but i still fucking battle mm -hmm. every day is a struggle sure and i is. say okay i need to get up today because if i can lie in my bed saturday sunday it seem to be my lazy times if i have if i eat a bit of bread or a baguette <laughs> i will eat for two or three days after that so it's like crack to me now <laughs> so I'll, i need to make sure that those two days don't turn into five days, yeah, five yeah. weeks, months, and so on and so on. But but you have to be fair to yourself too. Like you have to understand that you need a break too. Yeah, we're human. You have to be. Yeah. You know. And if it takes three days and you need three days, then fucking take it too. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes the mind will, like uh, one of my biggest problems I've had in life and, and it, it continues is jumping from one mind set to another. Jumping from the shoe company I own to the car program I'm making, to the, the music I'm trying to record, to the gym that's about to be closed on me, to the, the, the bar I'm opening, to, you know, I've got a million fucking heads. And there is times where I can't deal with two different things in one day. And there's times I can deal with five of them in one day. I can go flip, flip, flip. Or some days I try and do two and I fucking crash out. Like my brain yeah. fucking crashes out and I gotta go home. Why do you think you do so many things? Because I work like fuck because the reason <clears> being, I don't like sitting with my own thoughts because when I sit with my own thoughts, I become dangerous mm -hmm. and I don't like that. So I keep busy constant up at six in the morning, driving to Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester and back up the road. I can get asleep, I'm tired. But when I sit myself, my method, my madness kicks in yeah. and I start thinking crazy shit. Get a drink, get a bit of Coke, fuck it. Because when you start doing well as well, you've got self-sabotage, yeah. You just want to rip the whole ceiling down because with success becomes more pressure. Mm -hmm. So it's it's difficult that I've got to write, wait a minute, I've got to find balance, see my kids, have fun, climb a mountain, do whatever the fuck I've got to do naturally, everything be fun, keep learning, keep educating. There's a man, Akala, who I listen to quite a lot, and he always says that knowledge is power, uh -huh. which it is. Just educate yourself, unwire your brain. You can change the way you think and feel, but... It's scary to slow down. Is do you find that yourself that you work too much because it's your method of thoughts might kick in the negative ones? Yeah, there's, there's a form of escapism in that too. Of course, there is. And but it's good. I mean, what you're saying there is exactly right. And but what you're also saying there is you know yourself very well. 
if you didn't know that about yourself, you're in a fucking worse place for sure. It's, it, the fact that you know that shit, my head will kick in if I'm not doing something, that's taking care of yourself too. You know, you're still looking after you by going out to work and making sure you're busy. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Okay, it can get, it can get excessive, but there are tools and ways and books and people and out there who can help you yeah. uh, undo those crazy thoughts. The more, the more they spark in theirs, the more you hone on them, the more ho you hone in on them is the fucking more mighty you get. And I, I've been through those scenarios. I still go through those scenarios. Um, but you, rightly, I will find ways and means and ways to, to keep that mind occupied and, and methods then yeah. to try and overcome them when it, when it happens. Do you think, though, we can search too much? Yes. Constantly reading, constantly yeah. searching, constantly want to improve, constantly want to be the biggest podcast. But again, I question it. What the fuck? When you break it all down, what the fuck does it actually mean? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Well, do you know what? For you, I think it means a lot more than uh, just a simple way of, of, of a podcast. You're out there delving into people's stories and lives, and which, without a doubt, and you'll never know yourself, ever know. I'm sure you get kind of DMs and stuff, but you'll never know how much this stuff helps people. And that's in it, that in itself is, 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 is such an amazing, uh, it's an amazing thing you're doing because you're putting yourself to a position of traveling the world and exposing many uh, of, of your, not weaknesses, but the, your trouble times yourself and exposing the fact that you're human, great, and then but putting yourself under a lot of pressure. But there's a lot of respect. The reason why your, your podcasts are, are so, uh, uh, they're, they're going through the roof and you're getting so many hits on them because people are fed from them and you're feeding a lot of people, mentally feeding a lot of people. And people are listening to the stories of the others and they're like, fuck, I know what it is to be feeling like that. And if you didn't do that, then you, may, you know, that, that, that will pass that person by. You, we're talking about mental health, we're talking about getting help, we're talking about shrinks, we're talking about you know, reaching out, we're talking about being vulnerable. And if you don't know you're allowed to be vulnerable, then you'll, you'll never come out the other side. So you're, what you're doing is quite an amazing thing. Yeah, we've just got to keep learning. Look, people watching your story, they'll probably just think, successful boy band, he's done many things, he's a successful guy, but not understand that you actually struggle and battle mm -hmm. to this day. If what not, your problems will probably be 100 times worse than maybe the average person who works 95 because of the attention as well. Attention brings misery. So it does. It really does. A lot of people don't quite understand. And well, look, I think it's probably fair to say if you never understood why famous people got fucked up in the head, uh, because of the attention and scenarios or the bad things said about them or uh, being affected by what things are said is look at our kids today. They're all in the famous people now. They're all in the, the social medias and they're all coming home affected by that post. And it used to be just us because we were on your TV screens. Now everybody's got a TV screen in their fucking hand and they're allowed to be on it. And the more you put yourself on it is the more you open yourself up to the world and for people to have an opinion. And if you're anyway particularly vulnerable, that opinion's going to hurt you. Yeah, it's difficult, like you say there. It's we're constantly looking at screens. Words, words do sting. They do hurt you, no matter what you're. If you're reading that in your mind, then you, you people, a lot of people, yeah. potentially believe it. And the figures are there since social media's been about. There's been a sixty percent rise in male suicide, uh -huh. and people say be a man, but really, when you think about it, men are weaker than women. Men are the ones who are suicide rates going through the roof. So there's right. obviously some chemical imbalance or whatever it is that's pushing men mm. over the edge. And that is, it's scary, but yeah, fair play. So when you got yourself out the light, how were you feeling then in 2000s, 2005s and so on? Were you in your driving? Yeah, I thought I had a good grasp on life, to be honest. I thought I had, I fucking got this You now. defeated it, you're oh, cured. I, fucking, I got this <laughs> That's time. That's the worst time. I am yeah, the golden child, yeah. you know, I got this. Mm -hmm. And me and the boys on boys, we got back together in 07, uh, on into a, a kind of forced reunion back for that into 08 and stuff and you know it, it felt amazing you know it felt fucking great it was like yeah man and then i soon realized that the industry is the flipping industry as soon as i stepped back into those fucking shoes of that guy i left way back when oh my god it, it it's this it, again like i said it's spiritual you go back into a behavior that you once knew so it's like i guess it's like conquering and evil, be it, okay, let's call it a drink. Let's go straight to the pub. Conquering that evil and going, ah, I got this. And then going on a flipping stag do. 
into the fucking strip clubs and into the bars and in with the boys going, yeah, fucking, yeah, I'll fucking. And all of a sudden, you go, oh, shit, I don't got this. I don't fucking got this at all. And before you know it, you're back on the booze and you're back on whatever the hell you're doing. And I, and I think, but the, the, the fucking the train was, it was already left the station, man. I was on it again. I was <laughs> on it. The tickets were sold. Yeah. I'm going on tour. And then, yeah, it creeped back in. It cre that whole behavior creeped back in. The whole kind of dark side creeped back in. And, you know, we've been, I suppose, on and off tour since 08. Um, and in 09, like, probably the hardest tour we ever did in, was 09 without a fucking shadow of a doubt. Um, we were making uh, our album, it's called Brother. And the Brother album was, uh, it's called Brother because one of our pals, Stephen Gately, he died. So he was 33. And uh, yeah, he, he pretty much, you know, we all got the call to say he'd passed. And we were in the studio, we were making the album. And we were, that was just like a fucking, it, it, was, it was quite a surreal time. I don't think I've ever really got to the point of, understanding it of course we never understand death of course we don't it's not for us to understand really it's just for us to either grief accept or you know live with it whatever the case you want to be it doesn't matter who you lose your mother your father your, your sister brothers daughters you know when you love somebody and they they're gone it's they are gone like that's genuinely that's it like that, that's game over and it's up to all of us to to make life and them roads of how we're gonna live. But there's no right time for that to go. It's not like I, if I only had another 10 years, then I'd be happy if they were gone. You're never gonna be happy. You really are never gonna be happy like, ah, well, that was okay. Ah, I had enough of her anyway. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's when you love and you, you lose, uh, you just have to learn to deal with that shit. And me and the boys, you know, we, we went on, we, we completed the album. We were very unsure about that, but we did. We said we'd do it in honor of Steel Passing. And then we went on tour. Fuck me, that was that was bad. Like we thought, I think we all. I thought. I, maybe I shouldn't speak for the rest of the boys as such. One of the weird things about any any of interviews that we do um, that I've learned of me and the boys is we all have very different takes on our journey in Boys Own. It is like you know people talk about the, the books of the Bible or. or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John being uh, contradicting each other and what they're saying. And, oh, I, well, he's saying that, and he's saying that. Well, how could I be true? Mm -hmm. And it's pretty much in boys on us the same. You know, we, we all have a different view. I remember shit very different than they remember. But, uh, you know, we were all lived that, we were all there at that moment. And <clears throat> I think for me, going on tour was, it was like, I thought it was, it was where we were best at. But it, it wasn't. It was fucking clear as day that shit, this was so worse. hard. Standing on stage as four instead of five, looking where my brother always was and just not there. That was mad shit. Like, and that was another mad spiral down, I think. Yeah. That particular tour, mad spiral down, mad boozed up tour. Fuck me, yeah, thought I was boozed up for months yeah. and months. Again, escaping that feeling escaping that, that fucking, that torture, so that hurt or that pain, just trying to drown it out as much as possible. Yeah, it's, it's weird that if you're so low, so depressed or vulnerable, you probably thought going back on to it would have been your medicine, not realising it's probably been your poison, making you worse, making 100%. you spiral. Because I know when Stephen passed, God rest his soul, that he's all slept under the, uh -huh. in the funeral parlour. What was that thinking behind that? That no, was the church. It was the, we all slept in the church. Um, Steve was always afraid of the dark mm -hmm. and he was his coffin was in the church um, overnight so me and the boys were like yeah let's go sleep there let's go let's get our blankets or sleeping bags whatever the hell we got and go and have the crack in the church like we laughed our bollocks off <laughs> we laughed our bollocks <laughs> off we cried our hearts out <laughs> we you know it was amazing the priest was amazing and late night there was a knocking on the church door about 1 a.m. And uh, there's an old singer called Daniel O'Donnell. Fucking Daniel O'Donnell brought us in fish and chips. You know what I mean? <laughs> I sat down and had a wee dram with us. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, was, it was an amazing time and an amazing thing to be able to do. Um, 
But yeah, and that's that was the reason because Theo mm -hmm. was afraid of the dark, man. So we just yeah, fair play. Yeah. Even though looking back now, about a misery and about a ton more, and thinking it was, you must have made some fucking great memories, brother. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You must have made your your dad proud as well. Successful sisters and bewitched yourself. One of the most successful boy bands. You must have made a lot of people proud, and even the people going to the concerts and stuff. You must have made them feel good that you're going to see their heroes. Uh, I think. I think what music is or how I feel music is music or I, I had an opportunity to be a part of a deliverer of happiness for folk, a deliverer of emotions, memories. And I never stood on that stage as I am the fucking artist and I am the fucking pop star here. I stood on that stage giving the people they're the heroes. They're, it's their journey more than it probably was ours. We just, we were the makers. We made the shit. And the people lived the shit. And I, and I think that's what music is all about. I think to stand up there and go, yeah, fucking, I, I am MTV Awards and blah, 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 blah. They're bleeding doorstops on me toilet, you know? Which are amazing doorstops, don't <laughs> get me wrong. Look fucking great. <laughs> but the true heart of music and any creator I think is in the pleasure of the receiver yeah Boys Own's biggest song no matter what Aye. you hate it why fucking bored the shit out of me <laughs> <laughs> you know it, it touched a lot of people mm -hmm. but at the time I was in a dark place I was in a dark ass place so that song was like fuck off <laughs> just making you feel worse <laughs> yeah. yeah so when you go through all this now in 2020 you're still trying to get into the music you and a few of the old school boys yeah Thrown back a, so you must, there must be something inside you that even though there's something that you hate it in a uh, way and you know you spiral fast but there's obviously must be something in you that okay this is a different time maybe it can be better there's, there must be some passion in you that you must love it I learned a great trade mm -hmm. you know being an artist and being a not necessarily a, I don't know I, I learned something that I, I do love it but I think in a lot of circumstances of the boys on scenario it wasn't me it wasn't my character and I think now in this time around, I have an opportunity to do what I like to do. And it's, it's just more comfortable. And with the boys, old school friends like that, who are all into the same kind of scenario and understand the same music project and the same creativity. I battled a lot in boys on with creativity. They didn't understand why I did shit. They didn't understand why I grow a big ass beard. They didn't understand why I got tattooed. They didn't understand, they didn't understand that side of who I was. Well, these boys have no opinion on that. I rock up and I rock up and it's, they rock up and they rock up. We're big men in the industry now. There's not, there's not, we didn't grow as kids as such in the same family nickering, bickering, you do this, you do that, you can't do this, you do that. It's a, chi it's a childish position almost, boys on, continue to, because that's how we knew it. Yeah, he's only kids, man. Only kids. Only and we stayed babies. as kids. Yeah. I think that's the problem. Mm -hmm. The mentality stays as kids. And we're this now in this new project. I'm a fucking man. And so who is the boy? Is it Abs, you? Me, Abs, Dane, Dane Bowers. Bowers and Ben. Ben yeah. Fadu, Fats and and you're going to get ben. singles and stuff out next year? We got Album. We've we got a record out on November 20th. You excited? Yeah. Are you nervous? No. <laughs> if you spiral again, mate, I'm coming back here, mate, <laughs> and I'm fucking taking you up to no. Scotland, mate. No, I'm excited about it. It's fun. It's a fun project. And I'm doing songs I like to do. Like, we're kind of paying homage to uh, the 90s and, and the music we were into in the 90s. Um, it's kind of the 90s relived or remade, mm -hmm. but from just different artists we loved. Good stuff, man. Yeah. So moving forward for the future then, obviously you've got that project. What other stuff have you got in the pipeline? <sighs> Boy, get this TV show off the ground now. Yeah. You know, this is the next few month build. And I don't mean physical, I mean just on uh, viewership. And just enjoy this. Like I come into work here every couple of days for about an hour <laughs> people uh, I'd like to say I was in here for longer but <laughs> <laughs> lazy bastard well, people hour. missing and just go everything cool everything cool look mm. at the shots look at the clips look at the thingies and go right cool all in order and, and, I, and I love I love the process of what it is and what it can create we can create a lot of shit here and I'm, and I'm about to create my own world of content yeah. I'm mad for it like yeah good on you buzzing man. yeah you look happy bro it's good <laughs> to see you mate for anybody that's watching maybe struggling battling in a dark hole themselves, what advice would you have for them? I think it's really hard to advise anybody in a dark hole because all they want to tell you is, fuck off, you don't understand. And I get that. I've been there, I've been to the fuck off scenarios. But it can and it does get better. 
if you, if you let it. You can just block that shit out forever, push people away forever, and, and just want no help. Pride is involved. I'm not even, you know, us men, we can be awful fellas for just covering that shit up. But if you've got it inside you, you know, if you've got it inside you to, uh, to allow that little bit of release, to extend that hand and just ask someone, listen, don't even say you want help, just ask them what they would do. What would you do if, you know, this? don't be scared, man. It's a scary, the world's fucking scary. It's a scary ass place. And don't be afraid. It, 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 can, it can get better. Yeah. Fair play, brother. Listen, for coming on today and telling your story, it's very much appreciated. I look forward to seeing your journey again back in the music scene. So, yeah, I'll be jumping on your Facebook live later, <laughs> which we'll leave the link on in the description. But top man. Sound. Yeah, cheers, brother. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Cheers. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.